Welcome to the Center for the National Interests event on Russian governance and the crisis in Ukraine. I think it's uh, pretty clear by now that a lot of things are happening in Russia uh, domestically, which are being influenced by uh, the Ukrainian crisis, but the great struggle over Ukraine and uh, to some extent the international order. And uh, I think that uh, uh, some of the things that are happening in Russia, they are kind of uh, understandable and inevitable uh, when you deal with a wartime situation. Uh, of course, uh, uh, in Russia, you're not supposed to use the term war, term war, talking about what is happening in Ukraine. It's supposed to be special operation. Uh, but uh, I, I think that it's clearly a wartime situation in Russia, and uh, it influences their governance, and the attitude to a lot of things, including uh, the media, public relations, and propaganda. But I also think that there are more fundamental trends at work. Uh, and I don't know whether my colleagues would agree with me, but uh, there are a lot of people uh, in Russia uh, who want to use this crisis uh, kind of uh, to promote things, to promote policies, which they wanted to see all along but couldn't do it in the previous environment when there was a greater interdependence with the West. Uh, we have two uh, excellent speakers today, uh, really genuinely qualified, not only to talk about complex and contradictory Russian developments, but also to put them in the international uh, context and to connect Russian domestic developments to Russian foreign policy. We will start with uh, Konstantin Rimchikov, who is uh, uh, the proprietor and the editor-in-chief of Nizavisimaya Gazeta. Nizavisimaya uh, means in Russian independent, uh, and this newspaper is really influential and really independent. Uh, Konstantin also, till recently, uh, had a, a weekly program on Echo Moskvy. Uh, which was uh, a liberal-minded, I should say, a position-minded radio station, but uh, that station is no more uh, as a result of uh, closing of the Russian political space after the beginning of the war. Uh, and uh, we have with us uh, Anatol Levin, uh, senior fellow at the Quincy Institute. Uh, he is a prolific author. He is a major authority uh, on Russian history, domestic and foreign policy. And what I think is very important to know about Anatol uh, that uh, uh, while he spent time in Moscow, uh, met Putin, uh, but he also lived extensively uh, in uh, the United States, in Washington, in London, in the Gulf. So uh, when he talks about Russian developments, he, unlike many Russian scholars, he doesn't uh, kind of uh, view them uh, as totally unique, specifically Russian and out of context. Anatol genuinely is uh, capable of looking at the Russian situation and comparing it with other countries, other periods. Uh, let's start with Konstantin, the floor of yours. Uh, I greet everybody. Thank you for inviting me. So, uh, as I understand, I rather focus on the some internal policy issues rather than the uh, causes of this uh, war in Ukraine, because I understand that the audience uh, has quite extensive knowledge of different approaches to the crisis. So, uh, but I could of course also uh, put uh, some of my ideas, what is going on and why it is going on uh, on military fields. But regarding the internal policy, uh, I must tell you that for me it is clear that the so-called transition period or transit for Putin as a political phenomena is over. Everybody was talking about the transit uh, time in Russia in the last two or three years and the uh, amendments to the constitution two years ago to the Russian constitutions uh, constitution were viewed through this transition uh, process because everybody was talking about the role of state council what Putin could have 
if he occupies this or that position. And uh, so that was uh, the whole uh, discourse about transit. Now I think uh, uh, it's over. Nobody talks about transit. Transit is impossible in the sense which we thought of before that, because uh, in the condition of complete, uh, not only isolation of Russia from the entire world, not only uh, um, blockade of uh, uh, different transportation routes and delivery routes to Russia, which we now uh, can see in different uh, spheres of our life. It's also a new or relatively new phenomena, cancel Russia policy, which is generated by moral indignation. And it is a, uh, it looks like an, a decentralized in a way so that there is no mechanism like with sanctions that Congress passes the legislation or president signs a decree and something could change. Moral indignation and cancel Russia could last for a long time. And it is uh, from my point of view, uh, different even from the Soviet time, even from the early Soviet time when uh, Ford could bring his uh, uh, automobile plant to uh, Nizhny Novgorod to Gorky or uh, Hammer could uh, have relations with Lenin or Stalin or whoever it was. It was like individual choice of uh, businessmen who would like to take their own risks. This time, uh, nobody wants to take risk, not because they are afraid of risk, but because morally it is unacceptable. So I think that in this, uh, from my point of view, absolutely new quality environment, Putin uh, is not forced to leave, he can't leave, he can't leave the country and his people, and he's very popular, different uh, polls show that his popularity is around 70%. And uh, I think this is uh, uh, number one, uh, a new thing. Number two, that opposition in Russia has disappeared with all those repressive legislation, with those uh, legislation which prohibits to call military, special military operation as a war and the punishment up to 15 years. I think uh, with the censorship of uh, media, there is no opposition as we viewed because there is no way how to uh, get promoted your political ideas. Now we see that uh, three days ago on the 14th of March, uh, uh, Sakhalin uh, Regional Duma passes a legislation reducing the number of uh, members in the local parliament uh, from parties. And this trend is uh, taking place so that the new elections, which will be going on in different regions, will be uh, arranged uh, through the less uh, number of seats for party uh, members. That means that the demand for party representation will be lowered. Individuals which might be uh, standing for this or that uh, position uh, could be easily handled uh, by uh, government. Then we also have the phenomena of the drastic drop of incomes of middle class. It's not only the drop of incomes, it's also the uh, uh, evaporation of the way of life of the middle class, uh, of uh, their structure of consumption, their visits, their traveling, their sitting in the restaurants because prices go up, their salaries in dollar terms go down because ruble lost so much. Uh, uh, another thing, total deficit. The medicine, a lot of medicine has disappeared because logistical uh, chains uh, are no more in existence. And uh, those uh, medical stuff, which is still in the drugstore, is up to 40, 50%. But most of the medical stuff has disappeared. And it, it, has, it is also a new reality because you need to have it. And uh, what kind of handling of the station is not quite clear. Uh, so, uh, and uh, uh, fundamental, uh, like a mega political thing is that the new conflict with Ukraine means for me, the rejection of what we viewed as the major achievement of the um, fleet of the Soviet Union. That is the 
split of different republics without blood. So that was the wisdom of the leaders in 1991, 1992, who agreed that we take our countries in those administrative borders, which we inherited in the, in the December of 1991. Now, uh, the whole discourse is that, was it fair for this or that Republic to have that? Did they have it in historically? And for me, this poisoned uh, mindset is spreading uh, quite rapidly among uh, regular people's minds and uh, uh, doesn't make me feel safe and comfortable. Thank you. Constantine, you mentioned public opinion polls uh, suggesting that Putin's popularity is about 70. Uh, are these polls, uh, uh, the polls that were conducted uh, after the military situation uh, in yes. Ukraine? Yes, and both by Levada, which is uh, named as a foreign agent in Russia, uh, independent, and the uh, form, which is uh, pro pro Kremlin uh, poll uh, company, uh, uh, both. And also, it is interesting that most of the Russians, according to the polls, are for censorship. They're against uh, freedom of media. Uh, let me ask you uh, something. Uh that uh, I got talking uh, to people in Moscow recently. Uh, on the one hand, it seems that quite a few people are very opposed to the war, uh, really feel that uh, not only uh, Ukraine is in danger, which is self-evident, but they feel that Russian freedoms, remaining Russian freedoms are in danger. And these people are so upset that they are prepared to leave their jobs, leave the country, and many of them are not terribly wealthy. Uh, so they really vote with their feet. At the same time, I hear increasingly from young Russians who uh, till recently were quite critical of Putin. I hear from them that they're shocked by the extent of Western criticism, that they feel that their country is being ostracized and threatened. And they're saying this is uh, the end of any illusion uh, about the West being friendly or even tolerant of Russia. And they uh, have uh, uh, essentially uh, uh, to unite behind the flag and the flag is in Putin's hands. What do you think of, about these impressions? Absolutely correct observation, because you know, a lot of accusations of Russia and Russians go like uh, without any presumption of innocence. So that uh, basic principle of law is ignored uh, in this case. And if you do not have presumption of innocence, you are guilty uh, just because you are Russian, is of course uh, felt and uh, it generates the feeling of compassion to those who are punished. And if uh, uh, when you read the argument um, uh, why this or that uh, person is included, particularly in the last EU list uh, two or three days ago, it is interesting to note. Number one reason, he is very close to Putin. Okay, that means that Putin is illegitimate, according to this document. If you are close, you will be punished. But at the same time, they do not divide oligarchs, so to say, Abramovich or Friedman, of the Yeltsin time, and oligarchs who were created by Putin and who really come to the close uh, so then the second argument, his company generates a lot of income to the budget of Russian Federation from which Putin takes money for to conduct his war. So again, if the company didn't generate income, if they didn't pay taxes, that would be good. If they uh, do pay taxes in Russia, then it is bad. So even this logic, if uh, from my point of view, is not good. And it is so easy to show people how unfair the West is. They punish uh, Russia and Russians just because they're Russians. And of course, this is a boiling pot of these emotions, uh, because it is so easy to play this national uh, feeling um, uh, card. Uh, that's why you're absolutely correct that uh, on the one hand, a lot of young people who are uh, in post-industrial spheres of life and post-industrial or creative class by definition is a peaceful class because creative means peace, you have to create something. So this generation up to 34, 40, they are not inclined to, to do any what, uh, what 
type of activity. So Russia loses them. The rest of the country is united against these very simple and basic ideas uh, and uh, support the main Putin's uh, proposition. This is existential war because the West wants to destroy Russia. And in existential struggle, you have to stand up and to fight. Uh, and just to clarify, for the sake of our audience, you are not under any sanctions. And while uh, you clearly are, uh, how to put it, uh, independently wealthy, uh, you are the owner of a major paper, you have a strong liberal reputation, and on many occasions were quite critical of official policy. Anatol? Thank you, Dmitry. Can you hear me okay? I always need to check these days. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I'm very happy to be speaking again at the Center for the National Interest. Also an honor to, to speak alongside uh, Mr. Remchukov. My, um, my wife was actually working for Echo Moskvi as a journalist when we first met, so I have a kind of connection to that station. Uh, so Konstantin talked about uh, you know, Russian internal politics. I will begin at least by talking more about the, the situation with Ukraine. Uh, it seems to me that in effect Ukraine has won this war already. I know that sounds strange given what's going on. Uh, but uh, in effect, what has happened, I think, is that yes, Russia will get a treaty of neutrality, which will bar NATO membership, which Ukraine was not going to get anyway. Um, Russia will get to keep uh, Crimea, which it's held since 2014, and uh, all or most of the Donbass, of course, Russia has not yet succeeded in conquering the whole of the Donbass, but Russia has lost Ukraine. Um, you might almost say, I think, that uh, what has happened has turned Ukraine into a nation, which many of us were not sure about before because of the deep, uh, varying and opposed traditions in Ukraine. And um, the expectation uh, in the Kremlin, um, which appears to have been that um, because of the weakness of Ukrainian nationalism, um, the Ukrainians would in effect give up easily, and also that Russia would be welcomed in the Russian speaking areas of, um, of Ukraine. This has proved completely false. Uh, and of course, uh, the, um, the war is not going well. Three, more than three weeks have passed. Um, Russia has not captured any of its key objectives yet. And one reason for this, now I speak under correction, perhaps um, Konstantin would have a, a different view, uh, is that Russia simply did not deploy enough troops, not nearly enough troops for the goals it set itself, um, to invade a country the size of Ukraine from six different directions at once. Now, clearly one reason for that was that the, the Kremlin and the Russian military and Russian intelligence, which appears to have been quite extraordinarily poor, uh, obviously grossly underestimated the strength of Ukrainian resistance. Uh, but I have heard that it is also because um, the Russian government uh, have done their utmost, uh, at least until now, uh, to try to, to um, rely overwhelmingly on professional volunteer soldiers and not on conscripts. Uh, and without the conscripts, there just were not enough troops for the operation. Now, this argues that under all the rhetoric, there is also, of course, deep concern in the Kremlin. Uh, for the political consequences within Russia, uh, if large numbers of Russian conscript soldiers end up dead, the, you know, the, the response of their families remembering, you know, what happened in, in Afghanistan in the 1980s. Uh, so um, it does seem to me actually very likely now, unless this is blocked by Washington, which is possible as part of a, uh, an agenda of uh, basically repeating Afghanistan and bleeding and weakening Russia and trying to bring down Putin's government, uh, that we will fairly soon reach uh, at least a provisional peace agreement uh, with Ukraine and a ceasefire with a treaty of neutrality, um, exclusion of certain weapon systems, uh, and um, the territorial issues perhaps kick down the road, uh, you know, kick back into diplomatic space uh, with guarantees from both sides that they will not bring pressure to bear on, you know, this would mean the Ukrainians not, of course, blockading water to Crimea, uh, amongst other things. Um, and then the most severe Western sanctions 
will be lifted. There will, of course, be opposition to this from those who want to use them to destroy the Putin government or even, frankly, destroy Russia. Uh, but as I think we can see um, from uh, the rise in food prices around the world, uh, the deep anxiety which is beginning among those states, including vulnerable states, vulnerable allies of the West, Egypt, Algeria, Morocco, uh, at the, the rise in grain prices because they are dependent on grain imports, uh, and the prospects for deep instability in various parts of the world. And then, of course, the threat of Russian default, the very imminent threat of recession in Europe, and then that recession spreading to the rest of the world. I, my sense is that the way, that if there is a, a reasonable peace settlement in Ukraine, that the West will lift the most damaging sanctions. But that said, uh, of course, as Konstantin has said, deep moral cultural isolation will remain. Uh, and of course, the damage that has already been done to the Russian economy um, and to Western investment in Russia, Western trade with Russia will remain. Um, and I suppose the question then becomes, which I can't answer, I mean, Konstantin is a much, far, obviously far, far greater uh, expert than I am, I mean, what the longer term political consequences of this will be within Russia. Uh, once the patriotic surge of support for, for Putin uh, has died down, and the full implications for the Russian economy and Russia in the world begin to bite. And also, of course, the extent of Russian military failure in, in Ukraine, what the long term implications of this will be uh, for, for the Putin system. Of course, the fact that the, the men of power in Russia, the, this group has narrowed to such an extent, and that they were all of them implicated uh, in the decision to invade Ukraine will make it more, much more difficult to have, you know, a semi-agreed removal of Putin from within. Uh, but nonetheless, I have a sense, which, as I say, is is just a sense. I have no, you know, evidence for this uh, that this um, this war may turn out to be the the beginning of the end uh, for Putin, um, or not, you know, not immediately, uh, but that in 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 essence this. Uh, the, the, the Putin system has dealt itself its own death blow from what it has done in Ukraine. Thank you. Well, this is a very uh, striking uh, conclusion, Anatol. And uh, I'm sure that uh, a lot of uh, people uh, in the United States, uh, a lot of uh, people in Congress uh, uh, would welcome this conclusion. Uh, obviously, it did not provide uh, any uh, timetable uh, of uh, Putin's removal, but uh, uh, would you care to explain how do you think uh, this removal can work out and give us some idea, we said the beginning of the end, well, uh, you know, the Putin is uh, in a certain sense at the beginning of the end of his political career anyway, yes. uh, uh, because of his age. Are you suggesting that he would be removed in any foreseeable future? And if so, how could it work? Well, it could, of course, be that he will it, very easily be that he will step down himself in favor of a nominated successor. Uh, or that, you know, in, in private and in secret, he will be asked more or less forcefully and determinedly to step and who, down. Who could ask him? For people, I, I assume from within the the elite itself, but of course this will this would only come if there is serious discontent in Russia, you know, motivated by economic uh, hardship, um, and uh, as Konstantin said, the realization of the Russian middle classes that their their hopes, you know, uh, their, their lifestyles have have collapsed. What what I should say, I, I really do not think that the West should do is try to expedite this. Uh, through uh, sanctions aimed at, at regime change. Uh, because, of course, uh, as we have seen again and again, Cuba, 60 years, uh, the um, sanctions for this purpose have almost universally failed, while often actually consolidating the power 
of the regimes concerned. But also, as I indicated, um, the sanctions devoted to this purpose will massively hurt ordinary Russians, but they will also hurt every person around the world who depends upon cheap bread for life and, and will have drastic you know, effects on the world economy. So I think I, I should say very strongly that I believe that you know, if we can get a reasonable peace settlement in Ukraine, which certainly will not under any circumstances involve Russia returning Crimea, for example, uh, then uh, we should lift uh, the great majority of the sanctions against Russia. In other words, the, the composition of the Russian government in the end is a matter for Russians, not for us. Anatoly, thanks. Konstantin, I need to ask you uh, whether you want to comment on what uh, Anatoly have raised. Obviously, Russia is a free country, and uh, you can say anything you want safely about the future of Vladimir Putin. Uh, but uh, still, uh, I understand it's a very sensitive topic. So uh, if you are comfortable uh, to comment on that, please do. If not, we will move to, to, to the next question. No, actually, <laughs> I, I feel comfortable. Thank you for the talk, and uh, um, I, I can speak my mind easy. Uh, it's not a big deal. So uh, I, I must tell you that uh, uh, we were shown uh, like three weeks ago how the inner circle, this is Security Council works, how people behave, how they speak. And uh, it became quite clear that there is no uh, any real discussion. Uh, it is uh, the gathering of people who are uh, nearly frightened to speak uh, out on sensitive matters. And we saw it with the chief of our external intelligence. Uh, so my perception of uh, uh, Putin's prospects is that he, as a person who is being cut off from internet, is not uh, modern in the term of modernity, is not according to contemporary perceptions and understanding of what is going on. Otherwise, he would correct his articles on the Ukrainian past, on his concept that Russians and Ukrainians are one people, whatever it means, uh, that he would maybe get from internet new dimensions of this uh, uh, simple idea that in, the, in today's world, the ethnic roots very often are secondary as compared to uh, national self-identity. Uh, political identity, statehood identity. And very often the civil war is conducted between people of one uh, people, uh, this by definition, this is civil war. And so when he thought of ethnic roots of Russians and Ukrainians, he might have made a mistake because there, there are rumors in Moscow that he was preparing to uh, bread and salt meeting from Ukrainians uh, as soon as our troops appear. And that wouldn't be a war because people uh, would say that uh, Zelensky had 22% rating. Uh, people do not like him. The military do not respect him as a commander in chief. So just start doing it and the rest will be done uh, by Ukrainians themselves. That's why on the third day of the operation, he did what he really does. He appealed to Ukrainians, saying that the gang of drug abusers and their uh, Nazis sits in Kyiv, and it is difficult to strike a deal with them. And he said, maybe I will address military people. Maybe you will take over the power. And for us, it will be much easier to strike a deal. So how is it possible just to appeal? And none happened out of this. And that also shows and reflects that the intelligence didn't show them that the command in Ukraine is different. It is not the military Ukrainian forces who command all the operations. It is prepared by the West battalions who do kind of special operations, 
who have their own communications and so on. So I mean, from this point of view, uh, uh, to predict what is going to happen in the condition that Putin doesn't read internet, he sees only porno uh, uh, in internet as a threat to our morality. Uh, it is difficult to predict because when we do predictions, we predict as if we think he is like we. He knows all the information, but now it appears that he knows really only that information which he is supplied by those who are supposed to give him, and we don't understand the motives of those who. And this is a like a walking in the minefield. Since you don't have full information about Ukrainians, their army, their mood, their identity, you may blow up yourself in any in any place. So, uh, highly unpredictable for me the future. Sandrakin, thank you very much. Uh, and now we have uh, uh, the first question from our uh, very powerful audience, from our old friend and former government official Joseph Bosco, who is asking. Can the West do things overtly and or covertly to support the Russian people in removing Putin by providing truthful information they are now being denied? Uh, let's start with Ionatol, since I thought that you were not recommending something like that, but why wouldn't you speak for yourself? Mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to be honest, um, <laughs> U U.S. propaganda ha has been severely diminished um, over the past generation uh, by some of the things that it has been forced to to support um, in, in terms of U.S. policy. Uh, I do not know myself many liberal Russians who, however much they might dislike um, Putin and his government, would take on trust anything that was said you know, by the, the United States. Um, but um, my, my own sense more is, is that uh, eventually the, the, the truth itself will filter back from what has happened in, in Ukraine. Um, but I, I don't, I, 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 I'm afraid uh, I have become quite disillusioned with both the content and the effect of Western propaganda in this regard. Thank you. Konstantin, do you want to comment on that? No, information is very good because when you cut off Facebook uh, or, or, or I mean uh, uh, some uh, sources of information which are cut off by the Western companies, not by the Russian authorities, then we really uh, have less and less of that. Uh, because if you can't subscribe through uh, Apple Store to certain uh, applications, then uh, very soon uh, we will not have the access to this information, and it, it uh, covers the the whole spectrum. I'm I'm thinking of my subscriptions to say Wall Street Journal or Financial Times. As soon as they uh, accumulated money on that account will expire, I will be cut off from reading those uh, newspapers, for example. But uh, so information is always better. Uh, does this information serve the uh, mobilization end for those who are going to fight against the government? Not now. At least most radical and active people are in immigration since last year. They all are either in Lithuania or in Georgia. They left the country. And the rest is simply public. Uh, which doesn't like what is going on, but is not uh, not organized. Thank you. Uh, uh, the next question from Douglas Bell actually is a very interesting one. In which respects and to what degree does the Ukrainian diaspora, led to a degree by the Canadian finance minister Christian Freeland, affect the current situation going, going forward? And I would like to address this question to uh, Anatole. Uh, you know Washington well. Uh, uh, I'm trying to remember another case uh, when uh, a foreign country uh, was able to position itself as such a great power in the American political process. Well, one such country was traditionally Israel, but I don't need uh, to explain that Israel, a 
was a special case uh, because obviously the Holocaust. Israel also uh, had a special, if you wish, uh, moral advantage because of uh, being a small country uh, which achieved tremendous military victories uh, uh, against superior odds. Uh, I also would say that Israel, of course, uh, has a very important constituency in the United States, uh, a quite influential and well-motivated American Jewish community. It never occurred to me that Ukraine would be uh, uh, able to mobilize such support in America that their president would be addressing the Congress and essentially reprimanding in a rather patronizing fashion the president of the United States and the kind of telling him what to do if he wants to be a world leader. And if you would look how it was covered, quite sympathetically, quite sympathetically, uh, uh, as a legitimate conduct uh, on President Zelensky's part. Uh, Anatol, what's going on? Well, I think what this illustrates is that, you know, the, the, the lobbies, at least certainly the, the ethnic lobbies and national lobbies in Washington, of course, operate on the basis of money, uh, the Saudis, you know, very evidently, for example. Uh, but the most powerful ones are those which can appeal to American sentiments as well. And I think the Ukrainians are, are doing this with tremendous success uh, or because, uh, I mean, in part, of course, because of deep ancestral prejudices against Russia, going back to the Cold War, the support of other lobbies, the Poles, the Balts, but also uh, because, you know, Ukraine is putting up this tremendous fight against, you know, a militarily superior aggressor. Um, and this has, has given them, you know, great moral authority in Washington. Of course, as usual in Washington, this is also being used, you know, by the, the, op the political opposition, being used by all manner of political entrepreneurs, if you will, in Washington. But I think, you know, the most important element is sympathy. Um, and deserved sympathy. Now, of course, my fear, as we have seen so often with di diasporas, is that the, the, the diaspora may turn out to be more extreme and more unreal in its demands than the government that it wants to support or says that it uh, supports. Uh, in, in other words, um, one could have a situation in which the, the diaspora uh, or parts of it lends its support to hardliners in Washington who actually want to block a peace process with Russia, though for different reasons, because their aim is to weaken, even destroy Russia and isolate China in the world, and therefore they want to keep the war going in Ukraine. There, there have been some pretty definite signs of that. Um, and if you have a situation, for example, in which powerful sections of the diaspora say, uh, we can't have a peace settlement and there can be no lifting of sanctions unless Russia withdraws not merely from the territory it has occupied in the last three weeks, but from Crimea as well. If that becomes a, a condition uh, of peace and of lifting of sanctions driven in part by sections of the, the diaspora, then I think that will be a disaster. Um, obviously, a, a disaster for, <clears throat> for, for Russia a disaster for Ukraine, a disaster for the world economy. So I very much hope that, you know, the, the, the diaspora will see its, its role as supporting the existing Ukrainian government, not, you know, trying to impose more radical nationalist demands of its own. Uh, Anatol, you uh, come from one of the most prominent Russian aristocratic families. Yeah, I, will, I will not elaborate on that, but that's a historic fact. And uh, uh, I uh, do not know how much you know about the Russian community in the United States. My impression is that the Russian community in the United States plays no relevant political role and in no way can serve as a counterbalance to the Ukrainian community. Is this correct? Yes, I think so. Um, <clears throat> the Russian diaspora has always been very weak politically. Uh, in part, you know, obviously because of the, the, the implied association with the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Um, and uh, there was almost the, the same effect as, you know, on Germans during the First and Second World Wars, that the, you know, uh, that there was a very strong impulse to keep a low profile. Uh, but also there is this tradition, of course, well, of two things. Um, 
the, the first is of Russian dependence on the state rather than you know independent mobilization. Then the ambiguity of who you were mobilizing against for the Ukrainian, the Polish, the Baltic diaspora, it was clear you, you know you were mobilizing against Moscow. That is obviously more difficult uh, for um, uh, for ethnic Russians. And then uh, I hope Constantin will, will will forgive me, but you know um, my father, who was head of the BBC Russian service, would would often say this. Um, you know that that if you have a Russian community of three people, you will have three different um, churches um, and four different political parties, or maybe five, you know, a certain difficulty in, in combining effectively. Now, what will happen now, I don't know, because one is seeing, I mean, truly shocking levels of Russophobia. I mean, comparable to the, the kind of, you know, anti-German hysteria one saw during the First World War. Um, whether this will lead to some kind of counter mobilization i mean as constantin said it's already leading very understandably as news of this filters back to russia to a certain consolidation of russian patriotic feeling and one sees that among certain russians in the west as well uh, or whether on the other hand it will ultimately lead to the disappearance basically or the self-concealment of russians in the west I, I i don't know i very much hope not and if this did happen it would certainly be no credit to to western culture you know if we allow this war to produce you know uh, russophobic and xenophobic hysteria on our part that this would be very bad for obviously for, for for russia's position in the world but it would also be terrible for our own culture and we would be condemned by our descendants as our ancestors in 1914 have been condemned for their attitudes well, Anton, let me remind you how after 9-11, uh, uh, President Bush, to his great credit, uh, said uh, almost immediately that whatever problems we have with the Islamic terrorists should in no way be a reflection uh, on the Muslims in general, and particularly on the Islamic community in the United States. Certainly, we did not uh, hear anything like that from uh, uh, President uh, Biden or uh, uh, from anyone in Congress. And actually my concern is that this kind of uh, Russophobia, uh, not only uh, uh, obviously in my view is inappropriate and unfair, uh, but may have a, a totally unexpected uh, impact. That some of the people who so far were perfectly loyal Americans, patriotic, and devoted to their own country, that they may start feeling like uh, strangers in America and could become uh, targets for Russian recruitment. But I want uh, to ask Constantine. Uh, can I, uh, sorry, sorry, can I just add to that, that? That of course, yes. And the other thing is that, you know, we have seen so many Russians leaving now uh, to get yeah. getting out of Russia, educated Russians oh. are thinking of leaving. Uh, but of course, if they meet with Russophobic hostility in the West, they will have no choice but to go home again. And they will go home, I think, in that case, you know, in a mood, uh, they may still be angry with Putin, but they will be deeply hostile to the West as well. It's an important point. Constantine, I want to ask you about, uh, 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 again, this issue of uh, uh, possible Russian succession. And uh, to what extent uh, the Russian elite particularly people who are being sanctioned, to what extent uh, one may hope uh, that they would decide that they had enough of Putin and the Senator Lindsey Graham uh, recommends uh, would uh, look for a way, uh, presumably non-violent, uh, to uh, organize his exit. Or conversely, people who uh, are under sanctions and people who are generally being severely criticized some say uh, even demonized in the West, that they on the contrary would say, well, perhaps we disagree with Putin uh, on a lot of points, but uh, we cannot just uh, 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 let him leave and then uh, uh, we would have an orderly transition. Uh, they would look at the radical Russian opposition and they would say, well, these people like the Bolsheviks they would not be satisfied with the uh, resignation of the Tsar. They would want uh, to have something much more comprehensive and radical and perhaps bloody. 
Uh, and then they would say they have no choice but support the current regime. Uh, tell me where I'm wrong. No, your second proposition from my point of view is more correct because people feel much more safe now in Russia. I mean, those rich than outside. Outside the Russia, we see Romana Abramovich. He doesn't have any uh, rights to have Chelsea, to sell Chelsea, to have boat and uh, to have house and uh, nobody will protect him. They would rather beat him if, if he meets people on the street and nobody will protect their uh, property when the squatters want to uh, take it like it was uh, the other day in Deripaska's uh, Belgravia house. So, I mean, from this point of view, uh, uh, this lawless uh, atmosphere uh, towards Russians now, of course, uh, send everybody inside. And even those younger generation which wanted to leave the country, they now uh, found themselves without money because their credit cards, Visa and MasterCard are blocked. They can't pay for the hotels even in Georgia, in Armenia, where they uh, left in panic. And so very soon they will be back because you can't live uh, abroad without uh, money. And uh, they try to fix uh business relations because a lot of it specialists left so that they uh, send their resumes so that somebody uh, hires them but i mean uh, at this particular moment i think that nobody thinks about uh, overthrowing putin uh, everybody thinks how to arrange their new life new new life because everything has changed their uh, uh, parameters of their existence, the areas of their settlement have narrowed down to Russia. And this is absolutely new thing for the last 25 years where they more or less viewed themselves as citoyen du monde. No more citoyen du monde for Russians. They're all Russians where they might feel better than anywhere else. Kudarin, thank you. And uh, we have a lot of questions. I need to apologize in advance. We will not be able to take all of them, uh, but I encourage fairly brief answers so we, yeah. uh, we can address as many questions as possible. And now there is a, a mega question from Ellen Leibson, which somewhat changes the topic. How important is Chinese supporting the debates in Russia? Is it understood that China is avoiding total solidarity with Russia? Are there any countries making Russia feel less isolated? And you know, it's really a key question because uh, one of the assumptions uh, which I saw in the Russian media on Russian TV programs uh, was that Russia could count on such a new solidarity. That it, if it was not a formal alliance, it was in practical terms something close to that. And yet uh, uh, China, of course, uh, 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 abstained during the UN vote uh, on a resolution condemning the, the Russian invasion. But uh, uh, otherwise, uh, I don't see how much so far they were willing to do to support Russia, particularly in the economic area, providing spare parts for uh, Russian aviation, and of course, first and foremost, the banking. Konstantin, I know you wrote about uh, China and Russia extensively. What's going on? Yeah, even our tomorrow's article in the newspaper, while talking with you, I received the uh, article from our uh, correspondent, Vladimir Skosarev, who writes uh, about the uh, uh, new Chinese behavior in the, in the light of accusation that uh, China uh, has had a collusion with Putin, uh, allegedly they knew uh, since Putin visited the opening of the Olympic Games about the uh, Ukraine story. And now the Chinese uh, ambassador to America in Washington Post uh, clearly uh, put it. And uh, in some Chinese newspapers in Hong Kong, they also uh, do a coordinated message. China didn't know anything about the Russian plans on Ukraine. Had they known, they would have prevented this uh, disaster. But at the same time, they against sanctions because they think of themselves 
And at the same time, uh, uh, they insist that uh, Russia's concerns about their security, meaning the extension of NATO and Ukraine's role, were not taken into account uh, properly by the Western countries. But at the same time, we see no financial ties, uh, the rejection to promise anything on economic and except for gas or oil or whatever. And uh, I think uh, the, uh, at this day, I, I, I mean, in the last three, four days, even the tone uh, of the uh, public uh, propaganda talk has changed. Nobody uh, is claiming that China is with Russia. No, it is not with Russia. It is not for the West, but it is on its own and they calculate on the consequences. Uh, Anatoly, would you like to comment on that? No, I, I think Constantin is absolutely right. Then let's move to the next question. Julian Muller-Bell from the Atlantic Council. Can the panelists please offer their thoughts on potential off-ramps that Putin, as well as the West, could live with? Like Crimea becoming Russian, Donbass independent, and with Ukraine having a pass toward EU membership, but not NATO. I think it's a, a very good and very important question. Anatole? Yes, well, I mean, I, I think that the two sides are actually working to, towards this, certainly on a treaty of neutrality. By the way, it's something which is constantly ignored in the West is that, of course, the treaty of neutrality cuts both ways. It excludes NATO membership, but it also includes excludes a membership of any Russian-led security alliance. Zelensky has acknowledged, which frankly, you know, we should have been honest about before the war, that Ukraine is not going to be a member of NATO. Therefore, a treaty of neutrality is in principle a good outcome. On the territorial issues, I mean, this is very difficult. Um, but Tom Graham, uh, whose name will be known to you, former distinguished US diplomat, um, has suggested that really, I mean, the only way uh, around this is a, as a universal principle, is based on local democracy. You know, in other words, democratic votes, referenda under international supervision. Alternatively, of course, it may be possible, the Ukrainians have suggested this, to compartmentalize these issues uh, and essentially kick the, the ball down the road diplomatically. After all, this is what we have been doing now for almost 50 years as far as Turkish, the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus is concerned, for example. Uh, so perhaps that is a possibility. With the Donbass, I mean, one problem is that the, the, the borders of the Donbass are still undecided uh, because uh, Russia has not occupied the whole of the oblasts, um, only part of them. There is, of course, a possibility the, the Donbass uh, republics, Russia has recognized them as independent, has not in, annexed them. Therefore, in principle, uh, what could happen is that they will enter into a new version of the Minsk process, negotiating on a confederal relationship with Ukraine. I would not expect this ever to lead to anything, but if both sides you know, are anxious for a peace settlement that ends the present war, then that would be once again a way of getting this back into the sphere of diplomacy and kicking it down the road. But I actually, I, I'm becoming, I, I hesitate to call myself optimistic, but certainly more positive about the, the, the possibility that we are actually moving towards a, a peace settlement. Thank you, Konstantin. What do you think? Yeah. Are we moving closer to peace settlement? Yeah, but peace settlement, yes, uh, uh, quite possible and quite possible very soon. I think that uh, a lot of things went the wrong way, and uh, it is unpredictable uh, how this wrong way will be transformed into uh, a new Russian position, because we remember quite well that Putin started his statements when the uh, all this affair started with two uh, absolutely evident things. Disrespect of Ukraine as independent state. They even would say that there is no uh, a Ukrainian-Russian border. It is American-Russian border and where the fight is between Russia and America. And the second thing, it was regime change on the agenda. Now, no regime change. 
and we uh, recognize Ukraine. So that means a huge shift in the position of Russian leadership. A huge, it suggests that they didn't have that solid, uh, well-grounded uh, basis when they started. So from my point of view, Crimea will be uh, definitely uh, on the on the item as independent because that was the reason why Putin said that the fight is inevitable because later on nationalists will, would like to fight against uh, Crimea and uh, Russian language will be second thing for Donbass and for those autonomous and then the status of those uh, parts with this extensive autonomy specifically on language uh, independence. Thank you. Andrew Steinfeld is asking, who will pay for the re reconstruction of Ukraine? Are we looking uh, at a post-World War I scenario, uh, deep punishment of Russia for the years to come, with question mark? I think that confiscated $300 billion <laughs> from the central bank reserves could be uh, just a money which uh, the West could allocate for the restoration of uh, Ukrainian citizens infrastructure. The money are already under control of the West. 300, and some people say even more in liquid forms, uh, 300, up to $350 billion are controlled. Okay, so. Not all? Yes, I, I mean, I think that's very likely. I, I myself, however, if that is going to be an obstacle to peace, if Russia is, you know, demanding that this money be returned to it as part of uh, peace settlement, then I, I hope that that is what we will do. Uh, and that the, the West, you know, having failed to fight to defend Ukraine, uh, will continue its generosity. Uh, or will extend its real generosity to Ukraine after the war. Um, given the Western um, record in other cases, I'm not very confident about that, but I hope we will. I think that the last question was a very important and a very good one, because uh, it's not uh, uh, enormously difficult uh, kind of uh, to visualize uh, short-term interim agreements which can be signed at this point. Ukraine clearly uh, has a vested interest in putting an end to the Russian invasion, which is bloody, destructive, human tragedy, millions of refugees. Russia clearly uh, is not capable, and I don't think has uh, an intent at this point to take over the whole of Ukraine uh, and uh, with uh, the promise, realistic promise of major Western military assistance I think that uh, Moscow may find it in its interest to reach a, a quick agreement uh, which would state that Ukraine is not going to be in NATO and basically call it uh, a success. To what extent an agreement like this is going to last? To what extent it would be one of those numerous agreements signed before World War, or War I about the Balkans, which satisfied no one? and the kind of a, a prelude to a further confrontation, uh, that, of course, uh, remains to be uh, established and will uh, depend, you know, if you wish, on the wisdom of Russian, American, and European leaders. Whether we have such wisdom and strategic vision, well, each of us have our own opinion. I would not be terribly optimistic. I think it was a very interesting and informative <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing with you our perspective and thank you uh, to the audience uh, for listening and participating. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank, thank you. you. It was a pleasure.